Thank you very much. Uh, actually, thank you very much, uh, Benoit, for offering me uh, the opportunity to chair this great panel. I'm uh, very uh, honored and uh, especially touched. Um, Benoit is a very good old friend, very faithful, actually. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to be uh, one of the co-authors of uh, Benoit. And I can t tell you that it's, uh, it's really fun. Um, uh, I think, so I'm not going to add to the list uh, given by previous speakers. Uh, I, maybe Christine, Laurence, and Charles have forgotten some of the features. Uh, uh, I think Benoit is also fond of uh, cross-country skiing, of rock climbing, uh, and overall he enjoys uh, wild nature in general, and he has the ability, the rare ability to uh, admire the nature at any time, and especially in the middle of a Greek crisis. And I think this is uh, maybe one of the clues, uh, this ability to admire the nature at the middle of a big storm. Uh, I think on the top of his analytical skills, this is uh, very important to understand his success. So I'm especially delighted to chair this second panel since on monetary policy, technology, and globalization, because I think these uh, three uh, elements, monetary policy, technology, and globalization, are the keywords of Benoit uh, that, will, uh, that will best define his footprint at the ECB over his uh, eight years uh, term. So for a central banker, of course, monetary policy is the equivalent of basso continuo for baroque musician. Uh, but technology, globalization, rather pertain to the repertoire of uh, comp contemporaneous music with new scales, new sounds, new instruments, and a batch of dissonances. So Benoit is not the conductor of this music, so please do not blame him. Uh, he's just someone trying very hard to tune the instruments and sometimes to deal with broken strings. So this is really essential. So everybody that knows about uh, symphonic uh, orchestras knows that this is really key. Um, more, uh, furthermore, Benoit's curiosity and culture make him able to hear each of uh, the voices in this cacophony. So he's definitely open to new technologies and new ideas. So uh, like Hélène, I came back to the first speech in uh, February uh, 2012. Actually, this was a joint workshop uh, uh, of the ECB with, uh, guess whom? The Bank of International Settlements. Already, here in Frankfurt, about global liquidity and risk appetite, a uh, reinterpretation of the recent crisis. So at that time, Benoit was quite shy. There were only seven footnotes in this speech. Uh, so over the eight-year term, he delivered many speeches. This has been repeated. My own count is an average of two per month. Uh, and um, so it, about what we are going to discuss uh, in this panel, international capital flows, global liquidity, international aspects of monetary policies, uh, payment systems, and more recently, digital currencies. So uh, three months ago, he gave a very insight, insightful speech uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, uh, this was a joint uh, conference of the Central Bank of Luxembourg with Toulouse School of Economics. Uh, and the speech was uh, on digital challenges to the international monetary and financial systems uh, system. And so the keywords were all together. The three keywords were all together. So a good introduction for, for this panel, actually. And here there were 45 footnotes. So this is more in line with his standard. Uh, so you, pro you probably know that uh, Benoit is extremely popular in academia uh, because he's the one that makes sense of the research produced. And uh, also because uh, he's very helpful, actually. When a student walks into my office asking for ideas or references, I can always rely on a speech by Benoit and, uh, <laughs> for, for the analytical content and also for the footnotes. Uh, so uh, not to mention, of course, his uh, excellent uh, books. So now I'm going to turn to this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, three top researchers and top policy advisors. 
uh, I have asked them to tell us what, in their views, are the main recent transformations in the area of technology, globalization, that are bringing major challenges for monetary policies. Uh, we'll start with Christine, uh, who is going to discuss the new landscape uh, of international capital flows and its implications for the resilience of the system and uh, for monetary policies. So, uh, you, so I'm not going to present uh, each uh, of the panelists. Uh, of course, uh, you know them. Uh, just to mention something about each of them. So I just saw that she was, uh, she, she was named uh, honorary uh, commander in the order of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II for services to the British economic policy. Uh, so more specifically, uh, she's a former external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. I'm very much impressed by this uh, award. So thanks, Christine, for being with us today. You have 10 minutes, nevertheless. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here to celebrate bon Benoit's contributions to the ECB and the policy world more broadly. So as background for today, I did what it sounds like many of us did, which was Google Benoit's speeches. Um, I was going to just say there's way too many to read. I didn't have the staff that uh, Mark Carney or Mario Draghi has to actually count them. It's just a lot. <laughs> um, but what I did, so then what I decided to do was narrow it down and focus on just the speeches you've given that had these three key words in the title. That was still too many speeches to print out and read. Um, I even felt badly printing them out you know, under the pretense I might read them. We all do that, saying that sort of counts just to print them out, even if you don't have time to look at them. Um, but given the ECB's newfound attention to the environment, I felt badly doing that. <laughs> so instead, what I did is I'm going to focus my comments on your speeches that include those three words that you've given in the last three years, which is still a very long number of speeches, which is a testament um, to what so many of us have appreciated about you. You are prolific in choosing important topics, going beyond just the economic conjecture of the day, but really digging into important issues, pushing our thinking, summarizing the literature, summarizing the complicated academic literature in an easy to access way, and then pushing us, pushing us to think about what we don't know, what we can learn, what we need to learn and think about more. Um, and what has particularly impressed me reading through some of these speeches that I'll highlight today is how you were willing to question the conventional wisdom a number of times and even question your own wisdom that you said earlier in speeches you wrote a year before earlier. There's a number of times reading your speeches you see your thinking evolve as more data comes to light, more evidence. That's a hard thing for people to do. It's very hard for academics to do, but particularly hard for policymakers where everything you say is scrutinized and recorded. So for you to reassess and update your thinking over time as more research came out, as more data came out, is quite impressive. So I'm gonna to try to do a bit of the same, and I'm gonna focus on three topics which you talk, uh, talked about in your speeches over the last few years. Capital flow volumes, capital flow volatility, and the relationship between capital flows, monetary policy, and exchange rates. And since I do not have as much time as you usually take in your speeches, I'm just gonna focus on one angle of that, which is how all of these, uh, what changes have occurred in these three areas, and what that means for the resilience of the global financial system. So let me get right in there. Capital flow volumes. So here's a couple speeches or uh, articles you've written on this. Um, you were very early, um, might even say an early adopter, of an important shift that happened in thinking about capital flows, a shift which several people in this room contributed to, and that was focusing not just on net capital flows, yes, Philip Lane, Helen Ray, to name a couple, um, but focusing not just on net capital flows or current account balances, but gross flows. As you highlighted early on, if you are worried about vulnerabilities, even countries with fairly balanced net capital flows or uh, global or current account balances could still be highly vulnerable to liquidity shocks if they have large gross capital flows, inflows and outflows. So this is a graph which is very similar to the one Helen just showed us, gross capital inflows. This is for a sample of about 50 emerging markets in developing countries. It it shows the well-known contraction in gross capital flows since the, uh, during the crisis, how capital flows have come back to some extent but are much more muted um, over the last decade or so. And if you look at the breakdown of why this has occurred, uh, capital flows are more muted primarily because of a sharp contraction in global banking flows. So why has this happened? 
what has changed since the crisis? There's been quite a bit of academic research, which has showed, found some evidence for a variety of reasons why global banking flows have contracted. Some reasons are related to the crisis, after effects of the crisis. Some are related to policy changes adopted in response to the crisis. But one factor that comes through again and again, and there's very sound research now showing, is that a major reason for the contraction in global capital flows is regulatory changes. Tighter prudential regulations, tighter macroprudential regulations on banks have meant that banks have, holding everything else constant, contracted domestic lending and contracted international lending, particularly cross-border lending by banks. So um, that's fairly, you know, fairly straightforward. It shows regulations are working in one sense, one of, their, one of their intended goals. This is probably good for the resilience of the global financial system. Banks at the core of the system are safer, sounder, better capitalized. But where I think the more interesting work is, and where Benoit recently did a very nice article, was on the spillovers and the unintended consequences of this, what he called the known unknowns of financial regulations. And let me just give you one example, one which I believe Hayun will probably talk about more in a few minutes, um, in an example which comes from some research I've done with people at the Bank of Canada and Bank of England. One of these unintended consequences is as tighter uh, is on, uh, related to macroprudential FX regulations. So this is one of these regulations which has become increasingly used around the world, basically a set of different uh, measures which can be taken to reduce banks' exposure to FX, reduce banks' exposure to currency movements. Um, these measures have been used more widely. They have meaningfully reduced banks' cross-border borrowing and lending in foreign currency, particularly in dollars. That's been an important factor contributing to this contraction in uh, bank cross-border lending and borrowing. Um, but one of the unintended consequences is that as companies have found it harder to access cheap FX loans from banks, companies are starting to increase more FX debt directly to markets. So on one hand, this is, this is a good thing. Banks are less exposed to FX risk. We show in our work that banks' stock movements are now less correlated with exchange rate movements. So again, banks at the core of the financial system, sounder, safer, less exposed to foreign currency risks. But some of that risks have now shifted to the shadow financial system. More FX risk is held by mutual funds, hedge funds, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, and other players. Some of them may be able to handle that risk. Some may be less well able to handle that risk than banks. And whether they can handle that risk or not or understand what risk they've taken on, they are outside the regulatory perimeter. So regulators will have less of an idea of where those risks are accumulating and building up. So that's just one example of these unintended consequences which Benoit has talked about and which are very important as we think about the resilience of the system going forward. So second area where Benoit has made important contributions is on the volatility of capital flows. Um, he has this great uh, phrase he's talked about where he uh, assesses financial globalization based on the three E's if a globalization is efficient, enduring, and equitable. And in particular, he's focused quite a bit on whether capital flows have become more enduring, i.e. less volatile. So one might think, building on the comments that I just made, as global bank flows have contracted, and combine that with the fact that global bank flows can tend to be the more volatile type of capital flow, this would mean that global capital flows, one would think, would be less volatile, possibly more enduring, as Benoit hoped for. Uh, maybe his replacement would no longer need to worry about capital flows fueling bubbles and painful reversals. So to assess if this change has happened in the global financial system since the crisis, I'm now going to show you some results from some work I've done with Frank Warnock, where what we do is we measure what we call capital flow waves or extreme capital flow movements. We look at when there's sudden increases or decreases in capital flows coming into or out of different countries. And then what we do is we graph the incident of countries, about 50 advanced economies and emerging markets, that have seen a sudden surge of capital coming in from foreigners on the left, or the share of countries that have seen a sudden stop of capital flows coming in from abroad on the right. And what you see is since the crisis, it looks like these capital flow waves, these extreme periods of capital flow movements, have become more muted since the crisis. Now that could be good news, and this could be relate to the fact that banking flows, again, have been reduced around the world, those tended to be more volatile, and that means that we may see more volatility in global capital flows going forward. But um, much of this contraction in global banking flows has occurred in advanced economies. So a secondary question is, do you see the same pattern for emerging markets? 
emerging markets are the countries where, that are most vocal about concerns about sharp changes in capital flows, and also the countries less able to hand some of, handle some of these sharp movements. So now I'm going to show you the same graphs for just emerging markets. So what you see is the incidence of these sharp capital flow episodes in emerging markets are somewhat more muted, at least in terms of periods of large capital inflows coming from abroad on the left. But it's not so clear that these sharp episodes have faded, especially in terms of sudden stops. So this is more mixed evidence on the resilience of the global financial sy system since the crisis. At least for advanced economies, these capital flow waves seem to be more muted. The reduction in banking flows seems to be making capital flows more enduring. But the benefits for emerging markets have been more moderate. Now, another related factor, which Benoit has talked about quite a bit, and which Helen also covered, is what's driving some of these changes? How does this relate to risk and changes in the global financial cycle? So there's a lot of research, Helen summarized some of it, in the work she's been doing in this area, on how these movements in capital flows, the global financial cycle, tends to be correlated with changes in a variety of risk measures, also correlated with changes in monetary policy, global liquidity, bank leverage, something which Hyun has worked on extensively. Um, now, what happens is global banking flows have contracted. Has this been mitigated, this relationship? Now, this is, I think, an important area for future work. We don't quite know, but there's starting to be some evidence that at least the correlations between risk measures and capital flow movements seems to have been dampened. It's still there, but quite a bit weaker. So if this continues, again, I think it's too early in the cycle um, to know for sure, but this could suggest more resilience in the global financial system. Again, back to tighter regulations, reducing global bank flows, and thereby reducing the sensitivity of some of these capital flows to ups and downs in the global financial cycle and risk. So it could mean the cycle is more dampened, but again, too soon to say for sure. I Fred, we won't have time for the third. OK, OK, that I was going to talk about uh, the interesting area that Benoit has worked on, on how monetary policy affects capital flows in the exchange rate, and where he pushed our thinking in terms of if um, asset purchases and unconventional policies have different effects on capital flows in the exchange rates. I will skip that in the interest of the time and just conclude with one area where I think it, we'd be remiss to not mention Benoit's contributions. And we haven't heard much about it yet. And that is that even though I focus on his contributions to economics, and most of us have, uh, given the nature of this conference, the other area where I think he has made important contributions is not being afraid to bring in some political concerns. For example, one of his later works Works, or earlier works talked about the currency war criticism of monetary policy. Um, and he was ahead of his time in bringing some of these issues to the forefront. I'm sure many of you remember uh, Jack uh, Sintra uh, this summer when Mario Draghi talked about the need potentially for more expansionary monetary policy, which unleashed a torrent of tweets uh, from the US president. And then soon afterwards at Jackson Hole, as Jay Powell was getting ready to go up, uh, it was somewhat disconcerting that the main topic of conversation didn't seem to be whether he would suggest uh, the Fed would lower 25 or 50 basis points, but the main conversation seemed to be how long it would take before President Trump tweeted in response to Powell's comments. And we were not to be disappointed. The tweets came soon afterwards. Mm. <laughs> um, so it's fun to poke fun at this. Um, but these experiences do highlight the importance of Benoit's approach to policymaking. Even when he tackled these types of very sensitive topics, he always relied heavily on evidence and research to justify his arguments. This is a model for a central banker a model which is becoming more important as central bankers are subject to increasing political pressure, including to soften some of these reforms I just talked about that have strengthened the resilience of the global financial system. Whether political pressure affects the decisions of central bankers or not, it does put more onus on all of us to justify their decisions with evidence, so not to be perceived as making decisions based on politics instead of economics. And there, Benoit provide an excellent model we should all aspire to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And sorry for uh, putting pressure on you, but uh, we have to uh, uh, speed up uh, the panel. Um, but I think we will come back to your issues because uh, Yun is just going to uh, continue with uh, the uh, impact of uh, the dollar on these flows, uh, inflows and outflows. So it's perfect timing. Uh, so please, uh, Yoon, uh, where you are going? So as I said, I'm going, not going to uh, present him. 
uh, he has a, a very brilliant career, but the important point today is to know is that he's going to be uh, the next uh, lucky colleague of Benoit. <laughs> well, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, it's, uh, this event is, uh, in some respects, a retrospective, but uh, for the BIS, um, uh, we're very much looking forward to welcoming Benoit de Basel. Um, now, to the extent that the BIS is serving the whole central banking community, you will not lose him. Uh, and in fact, uh, as, we, as we open this new chapter in financial developments that are really um, putting the central bank and central banks at the heart of uh, these far-reaching developments that are changing the nature of money, the financial system itself, um, I think this is the perfect stage for Benoit to open a new chapter. So please watch this space. Uh, and Lael will, will uh, very much um, expand on these themes. What I thought I'd do is just to follow up on Kristen's presentation and, and um, discuss some latest developments. Now, what I'd like to do is to begin with the emerging markets, uh, but I'd like to move uh, straight on to the advanced economies shortly. This chart in, in the black line, the black line shows the annual um, appreciation of the broad dollar index. So when that black line is above zero, uh, it represents an appreciation of the broad dollar index over the previous year. The red line, the thick red line, is the percentage growth in dollar-denominated credit to emerging markets, so annual growth. The dotted line is bank flows, uh, and the broad and the uh, bold line is uh, um, is total dollar credit. And what you see is this very striking pattern of reflected symmetry where when the dollar has weakened in the previous year, uh, this coincides with a period of very rapid growth in dollar-denominated credit to the emerging markets. And what's, in, and what's interesting is just to uh, think about the last three or four years through the lens of this chart. From the beginning of... Um, well, actually, it was in the middle of 2014, the dollar began, began to appreciate very sharply. You see the black line going up. That coincided with a pullback in uh, dollar credit to emerging markets, culminating in the devaluation of the renminbi in the summer of 2015. Whereas in 2017, it was actually a very good year. If you recall 2017, that was a year when even though the, the Fed was raising rates, financial conditions were actually very accommodative, and the real economy was also doing very well. Alas, in 2018, the dollar began to uh, strengthen again, and we've seen the latest downturn. Now, why might this be the case? Let me come back to this at the end, but let me just uh, quickly skip to this chart. So one hypothesis, as uh, Ellen in the previous session, and as Kristen uh, mentioned in this session, is that this has to... Do, uh, this has something to do with financial intermediation. So if financial intermediaries are more forthcoming during a period when the dollar is weak, you would imagine that balance sheet capacity is more ample. Conversely, when the dollar is stronger, balance sheet capacity shrinks. And the blue line here gives you the CIP deviation. It is the deviation, uh, it's, so it's a difference between uh, the interest rates that are uh, inherent in dollar funding in the money markets versus the interest rate on the dollar that's implicit in the FX swap market. The sign convention is such that when that blue line is negative, it means that dollars are very scarce in the FX swap market. And what we've seen is that even though textbooks say CIP deviations are impossible, it, uh, you can see that uh, they've been uh, the rule rather than the exception after the crisis. And again, you see this very striking reflected symmetry where a stronger dollar, which is the red, again, the broad dollar index, is associated with tighter financial conditions. Now, if you run a regression where you say, uh, where you uh, um, regress the change in the CIP deviation uh, on the broad dollar index, uh, you actually uh, get a sensitivity of how uh, much the CIP deviation of a particular currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar is as a function of the broad dollar index. And you can actually plot it um, on this kind of chart where um, we're measuring the, the dollar beta 
it's the regression coefficient where you're asking how sensitive is the CIP deviation of the euro, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, with respect to changes in the broad dollar index. And that's the dollar beta for the euro. And then you say, well, what is the average size of that CIP deviation of the euro? And what you see is that there is a striking uh, positive relationship where it's the currencies whose CIP deviation is most sensitive to changes in the dollar that tend to have the largest deviation. In other words, this is a cross-sectional relationship that's rather like the capital asset pricing model. The dollar, your sensitivity to the dollar is a pricing factor in the asset pricing sense. And notice the really striking thing. Uh, the left-hand panel is a three-month, the right-hand panel is a five-year basis. Notice the really striking thing here, which is that it is the safe currencies that tend to have the largest deviation. So it's not the Australian dollar or the New Zealand dollar, it's the yen, the Danish krona, the euro, and the Swiss franc. And um, one hypothesis here is that uh, the institutional investors from the euro area, from Japan, they have to invest globally, but they have obligations to their policyholders and beneficiaries in their home currency, and they have to avail themselves of the swap market. And so they are in the dollar-denominated securities market, but they would rather not be. And because of this, uh, this is um, going, having to go through the banking sector and is showing up in its sensitivity to uh, the dollar itself. So what are some of the implications? Um, well, the broad dollar index, um, and as Kristen said, various risk measures such as the VIX index of implied volatility in the stock market have lost some of their explanatory power as compared to the pre-crisis years. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what are the now uh, the more relevant risk indices? And, and to some extent, the broad dollar index may actually have a role to play there. Another indicator is that um, another implication is the, impl uh, the, um, the, uh, the implications for monetary policy itself. Now, whereas institutional investors from Japan, the euro area, um, tend to go for long-term securities, long-term bonds, the hedging takes place normally at much shorter uh, maturities. So they're rolling over maturities at a much shorter frequent, uh, at a much higher frequency. And at a, first, at a first approximation, the hedging cost is the short-term interest rate. And so when you take that hedge return, the slope of the yield curve itself comes in in these hedging decisions and the market dynamics. And in that sense, monetary policy and the relative, sh uh, and the relative slopes of the yield curves across the major jurisdictions are going to be very closely related as well. And it would not be an accident, for example, that when uh, the Fed was raising rates uh, um, uh, in, in the years running up to the most recent period, and as the yield curve was flattening, we saw a much greater demand for euro area securities because even the long-term rates were low, the short-term rate was even lower, and therefore uh, the slope was higher. We saw a lot of capital inflows into, into euro-denominated securities. And I think... Um, what all this means is that uh, this very sharp distinction between real and financial developments may be harder to draw even than uh, perhaps you had once thought. So, and yes, let me conclude Perfect. There. This is perfect, yes. Jun. Thank you very much. So we've seen the, the, the flows, the relativity of the flows, the impact of uh, the dollar on the flows and on the prices, actually. And something is missing in the picture and is going to be uh, uh, brought by uh, Len now. Uh, this is the digitalization. And we have some, suddenly uh, a new dimension of the discussion that is uh, erupting and how can we analyze this. So uh, Len, um, I would say, also delivers speeches. And uh, she's actually very good in that. Uh, I read a number of uh, speeches with a lot of interest. Uh, I recommend especially uh, the last October speech on uh, uh, well, digital currencies, stable coins, central bank digital currencies, especially uh, fast payment systems. 
which actually is the, the focus uh, at the end of the speech. Uh, really uh, very insightful. So thanks for, for being here and your, the floor thanks, is yours. Yes. So I've been working with Benoit now for over, I guess for a decade. Uh, starting at our respective treasuries, where we both were drafted as financial firefighters. And then I followed him into the world of central banking, where uh, we were both working on stabilization, recovery, and normalization in our own jurisdictions. And over that time, I've developed very deep admiration for Benoit's keen insights and outstanding judgment. But just as important, Benoit always has a plan. And it's generally a good plan, and it's generally addressed to the right problem. And he generally gets it executed with exceptional efficacy and strong support. And that, in my opinion, is a rare and invaluable combination in public service. Benoit's success, I think, uh, can be seen actually in the data. Nope. <laughs> nope. Hold on. There we go. So his tenure at the ECB was marked by an incredible turnaround in both unemployment and output growth. In fact, uh, at the Fed, we now term that uh, the curé curve, or la courbe curé, which is one of the few things that works in both languages. Uh, Benoit's research interests are very forward-looking, as others have noted, and extend well beyond the macroeconomy. When he was appointed chair of the CPMI, the Global Standard Setter for Payments Issues. He doubled its output, <laughs> resulting in nearly 75 reports. So you can add that to the 175 speeches. And he turned its focus to digital currencies well before many other central bankers realized these issues would be transforming our worlds. Indeed, the number of Google searches for central bank digital currencies increased sharply over the course of his tenure. And the, at the start of his term, Bitcoin's market capitalization was small, and there were only a handful of cryptocurrencies. But in the eight years since then, you can see that both the market cap and the number of cryptocurrencies is now in the thousands. Indeed, the potential of cryptocurrencies and stable coins to scale rapidly uh, is illustrated by the accelerating rates of technology adoption and the growth of large networks. And that, I think, is the topic that I was asked to speak about. And we can understand, I think, through looking at some of these trends, why uh, uh, Benoit was asked by G7 uh, leaders uh, to look at the issue of uh, emerging stable coins. If you look at uh, the adoption rates of new technologies, uh, essentially, uh, they compress over time. So what once might have taken 40 to 50 years, uh, landlines to reach 80% of the population later took 15 years. In the case of the internet, this is looking at the US, and most recently, smartphones and social media have achieved the same level of adoption in less than a decade. But that rapid adoption is even more evident in the payments landscape where network externalities are extremely important. Between, in, over the course of five years, uh, Venmo transactions grew over 66 times. In China, mobile payments grew over 35 times in only five years. And in India, on, over only three years, we've seen that kind of payment uh, adoption uh, going uh, to uh, 400 times uh, the pace. In terms of uh, digital currency payments projects from big technology firms that start with network advantages, they have the potential to scale even more rapidly. And because the utility of any medium of exchange increases with the size of the network that uses it, the power of a stablecoin payment system depends on the breadth of its adoption. With nearly one third of the global population, as active users, the Libra stablecoin project stands out for the speed with which its network could reach global scale. And that potential is leading central bankers and other authorities to revisit fundamental questions about money and payments. While central bank money and commercial bank money are the foundations of the modern financial system, non-bank private money or assets also facilitate transactions among a network of users. In some cases, those non-bank private assets may have value only within the network, 
While in other cases the issuer may promise convertibility to a sovereign currency such that it becomes the liability of the issuing entity, in contrast, stablecoins aspire to achieve the functions of traditional money without relying on confidence in an issuer, such as a central bank, to stand behind the money. And for some potential stablecoins, it appears users may have no rights with respect to the underlying assets or to any issuer. So while we've seen the growth of massive payments networks on existing digital platforms, such as Alipay and WeChat Pay, so far these networks operate within a jurisdiction based on the sovereign currency as the unit of account, and balances are transferred in and out of bank or credit card accounts. We've also seen the issuance of stable coins on a much smaller scale, such as Gemini or Paxos. What would set the Libra project apart if it proceeded is the combination of an active user network of more than a third of the global population with the issuance of a private digital currency opaquely tied to a basket of sovereign currencies. That potential uh, to be adopted globally in a short period and to establish itself as a potentially new unit of account means the stakes are exceptionally high. Libra and indeed any stable coin project with global scale and scope must address a core set of legal and regulatory challenges. Unlike social media platforms or ride-sharing applications, payment systems cannot be designed as they go due to the nexus with consumers' financial security. So to just give you an illustration of what kinds of risks uh, regulators are worried about, cryptocurrencies already pose risks to the financial system. Estimated losses from fraud and thefts associated with cryptocurrencies nearly tripled over the last year alone, and in most cases, customers bear the losses. By contrast, consumers in the US and the euro area expect strong safeguards on their bank accounts and the associated transactions. Statutory and regulatory protections mean that consumers can reasonably expect their deposits to be insured up to a limit, fraudulent transactions to be the liability of the bank, transfers to be available within specified periods, and clear standardized disclosures of fees and payments. Not only isn't it clear that comparable protections will be in place with Libra or what recourse consumers will have, it's not even clear how much price risk consumers will face since they don't appear to have rights to the stablecoin's underlying assets. Illicit finance is also a significant concern. In one industry report, research found that roughly two-thirds of the 120 most popular cryptocurrency exchanges have weak AML, CTF, and KYC practices. Only about a third of the most popular exchanges require ID verification and proof of address. And that's notable since one study estimated that more than a quarter of Bitcoin users and roughly half of Bitcoin transactions are associated with illicit activity. So there are also questions related to financial stability. Liquidity, credit, market, or operational risks alone or in combination could trigger a loss of confidence and run-like behavior. Of course, the precise nature of that risk would be driven in part by how the stablecoin is tied to an asset, if at all, and the features of the asset. For instance, a stablecoin tied to one-to-one -to, -one to an individual sovereign currency would be quite different than one tied to a basket of currencies. A stablecoin built on a permission network, quite different from a permissionless network. And a stablecoin used uh, solely by commercial banks, quite different from one used uh, for general purpose use by consumers. Similarly, there are important implications for monetary authorities, particularly for smaller economies. There may be material effects on monetary policy from private sector digital currencies as well as from foreign central bank digital currencies. In many respects, these are similar to dollarization, aside from the fast pace and wide scope of adoption. So for all these reasons, the emergence of stable coins is raising important questions for regulators everywhere. In, in the United States, the regulatory framework is not straightforward. Our current framework is based largely on whether a cryptocurrency is deemed to be a security or has associated derivative financial products or the participating institutions are themselves supervised. Unlike many other jurisdictions in the euro area, regulators don't have authority over retail payments in the US. Moreover, the regulatory challenges are likely to be inherently cross-border in nature, which is why the G7 took this up. 
Because stable coins are unlikely to be bound by physical borders, regulatory actions in one jurisdiction are unlikely to be fully effective without coordinated action elsewhere. Of course, the prospect of global stablecoin payment systems has intensified the interest in central bank digital currencies. Proponents argue that central bank digital currencies would be a safer alternative to privately issued stable coins because they would be a direct liability of the central bank. But a more relevant question may be whether some solutions may be able to offer the safety and benefits of real-time digital payments based on sovereign currencies without necessitating radical transformation of the financial system. In the US, there are important advantages associated with current arrangements. Physical cash in, cash in circulation continues to rise due to robust demand for the dollar. And of course, as others have noted, the dollar plays an important role globally. Moreover, we have a robust and diverse banking system that provides important services along with a widely available and expanding variety of digital payment options. Circumstances where the central bank issues digital currency directly to consumer accounts for general purpose use raises profound legal, policy, and operational issues. That said, it's important to study whether we can do more to provide safer, less expensive, faster, or otherwise more efficient payments based on sovereign currency. Some jurisdictions are likely to move in this direction faster than others based on the particular attributes of their payments and currency systems. And so we are actively seeking to collaborate with other jurisdictions as we advance our understanding of the potential benefits and costs. In the US, we're actively working to introduce a fast payment system for the United States. Benoit's been very involved in the one here to improve the speed and lower the cost of consumer payments. And finally, as we work to reduce frictions, one of the most important use cases is for cross-border payments, which everyone agrees are slow, cumbersome, and opaque. Authorities in many jurisdictions recognize the importance of cooperating across borders with each other and the private sector to address these cross-border frictions. So given the stakes, any global payments network will be expected to meet a high threshold of legal and regulatory safeguards before launching. More broadly, the work ahead is not easy. The policy issues that I've outlined are complex, the coordination challenges are significant, and there are few simple fixes. That is why I'm especially pleased that Benoit will continue to help us navigate these issues as the new head of the BIS Digital Innovation Hub. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lel. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, food for thought. I already have some questions, but I need some guidance about, because officially we have three minutes for the discussion. OK. So <laughs> who would like to start? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for the very comprehensive presentations. Uh, can I ask uh, one question to Christine Forbes? Um, perhaps um, one missing explanation on why uh, banking flow stopped. Um, if I can understand from your diagram, this happened around 2010, 2012. So that perhaps was the fear of the uh, bringing of the euro. Um, so perhaps th this is the most uh, uh, useful explanation of why this happened. What do you think? Thank you for the, this very concise question. And of course, the, the, the answer is very simple, but uh, please keep it. Uh, <laughs> can we take a, a couple of others? Yes, here. Yeah. Two quick questions, one for Christine and one for Hune. For Christine. Um, Facebook uh, paid zero taxes in Europe since it was ever created. And typically, the possibility of printing money is called seigneurage or tax, seigneurage. Why should a company that never pay taxes in Europe should be given something that only governments have for free? The second question, Hewn. Um, you mentioned a lot about flows. The, one of the key reasons in markets we see is that given 100 the currency of the wealth, where people are denominated, so the passport. A third is American, and two thirds is the rest of the world, and the rest of the world does not trust their own currency because they don't trust the government. And so what happens, half keep dollars denominated, so keep assets in dollar denomination. 
So they might be in any currency, they don't trust their own government, so they basically swap into dollars. Is this the reason why the beat is so much higher? Because fundamentally, the rest of the world does not trust their own government, and that's why they resolve to the dollar, and hopefully they, they will trust the euro, that will be rebalanced. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to ask a question. Um, coming back after listening to Lail, coming back to the two of you, uh, so we've seen the regulatory challenges uh, with uh, digital currencies. Uh, there are different types of digital currencies, of course, but what, what are the main challenges for capital flows and capital markets? We can think about the market for safe assets, but also the markets uh, in emerging economies. So could you give your insights about, about this? Okay, so, so uh, Yun? Would you like to start or? or yes, I can, yeah. I can start. So, um, so Davide asked a very good question, which is uh, why so much in, in dollar assets? I think here it's, it's partly historical, but I think it's very important to recognize how all the pieces fit together and reinforce each other. So on the one hand, dollar is an invoicing currency, but that means that working capital has to be in dollars. But then if you're investing um, in an oil plant, then of course uh, oil is priced in dollars, therefore you have to inv you have to borrow in dollars, but that means that there's a lot of dollar debt out there, which means that it ends up on the portfolio of, uh, of global investors. So it's not US um, borrowers as such, it's the dollar denominated security. So it, it's very um, self, I mean, it, it is a reinforcing set of factors, and uh, provided that everyone else is doing it, of course, that you would want to do, uh, do that to, to reinforce. Um, let me just um, you know, add how happy we are to have Benoit the BIS, because I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, easy to underestimate how much interest uh, there is out there. And for central banks, uh, let me just reiterate something that I said at the very outset, which is central banks really find themselves at the center of some of the most far-reaching developments in the financial system. It's the nature of money, the nature of the payment system, as Lael was uh, laying out. And um, I think there is, um, so this is an opportunity for us to really rethink some of the most fundamental questions. And uh, uh, you will see Benoit very often in Basel when you, when you come to Basel. <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to be, um, uh, I think it's going to be, well, it's, it's certainly a, a real privilege for us to uh, uh, you know, continue our work in this area. I think it's, um, a, I think to the short answer to your question, to your question, and yes, about what are the implications of digitalization for these traditional international finance questions is we have yet to see. But I think uh, uh, that they are probably, um, uh, the answers probably will, will surprise us when we, when we finally get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Christine? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, three questions. So first, the contraction in international bank flows, it just mechanically, a lot of that is Europe, because Europe was where a lot of the boom happened before in cross-border bank flows and where some of the collapse happened. Um, but it wasn't just because of, say, slower growth in Europe or pressure on individual banks in Europe. There's also quite a bit of research that shows that it was tighter regulations in a number of countries which contributed, and also some of the uh, uh, crisis resolution packages Packages. So, for example, there's um, one study which shows for the UK, the UK passed what was called a funding for lending scheme, which basically gave increased incentive to lend domestically instead of internationally. And that led to a meaningful contraction in UK cross-border bank lending, which actually contributed meaningfully to the global con uh, contraction in cross-border bank lending, just because the UK is such a big share of cross-border bank lending. So it wasn't just slower growth in Europe. There's a lot of other things going on at the time, too, although mechanically Europe is a key part of the story, for sure. Um, the question on international taxation. So I think some of that is especially related to the tech companies is more for Lil than for me. Um, but I will just make a comment that Phil Philip Lane is in his pre- policy life wearing his academic hat did some very nice work showing how these differences in tax rates do matter quite a bit for explaining capital flows. He showed how, for example, in Ireland, some of the tech companies' uh, preferences to locate there for tax reasons can explain a big chunk of what we're seeing. So it's, it's, yes, it is very important. Um, 
your question, Agnes, on the big challenges for capital flows due to technology and digitalization, a whole host of fascinating issues. But let me just link it back to the one that I spoke about, which was, I think, post-crisis, a number of the reforms we've taken have made a sounder, safer banks at the core of the financial system. That's good. There's some evidence I showed that suggests this had made, has made the global financial system more resilient, maybe somewhat less vulnerable to changes in the global financial cycle, risk measures, the made capital flows more enduring, as Benoit kept focusing on. So that's good news. But new technology and some of these new forms of capital flows, especially if it can happen by pressing a button on a phone, does make me worry that then these risks are shifting more to this sector. So banks are sounder, but now the capital flows are shifting elsewhere. So some of the progress we've made there, um, we should not rest on our laurels. There's, there's going to be a whole new area we're going to have to shift our attention to. Ben? No? So I'm going, I think we are going to, to close this uh, wonderful session. Uh, what can I take home? Uh, I think it's quite clear for the ne next eight years, we need to work very hard on uh, looking at uh, capital flows separately for each uh, type of capital flows, not only growth flows, but also the different types of, and also linking this discussion with the payment systems, because as you say, um, the distinction uh, is going to be difficult uh, going forward. Um, the asymmetries in the system, we, the world is not flat, we know that. It's not flat from a geographic point of view, but also with respect to, to prices. So this is a very important message. And also uh, it's fascinating how we need today to rethink about what is a currency, what is an international currency, what is an international monetary system. So this is fascinating because we are sometimes uh, reading old stuff uh, to, uh, to make sure uh, we, we really understand uh, what these new things uh, are bringing. So it's really stimulating for, for the research community. So thanks a lot uh, for organizing uh, this wonderful seminar. <laughs>